Welcome to the Monday Study. This is Practical Apologetics, Session 1. You can get more information by going to themondaystudy.com or themondaystudy.org, and you can find more information about other classes there as well. God bless. Um, the notes, uh, the full notes uh, from tonight will be on the website. Um, the site is at the bottom of your notes. It's themondaystudy.org or mondaystudy.com. It'll also be on the SGA website if you want to go there. We're recording all of these. We've made sure that that takes place. We also will have a blog. What the blog is is just kind of a, um, a repeat of the important things that, that we've gone over and maybe some of the questions and other things that have come from that. And so those will be up. And then we will also have a place on the site for you to post questions. So if you have questions or someone has asked you a question or something has come up and you're not sure how to answer it or what to say, then post the question. And as, as long as you don't say, don't let anybody else know this, we will post that with our best answer online too. So we'll have a whole list of questions as we go along. Why are we doing apologetics? Thank you for asking. Most people in, in my generation... Most people in my generation and before, when we were uh, younger, we were either members of the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts. And it was a great organization. By the way, that both were founded by Christians on Christian principles. And uh, one of the things that the Boy Scouts taught us in particular was to be uh, self-reliant, to be honest, uh, to be helpful, friendly, brave, you know, the whole thing. But the motto for the Boy Scouts, the motto was be prepared. The Apostle Peter, I think, um, had the same thing in mind, and I think the Boy Scouts probably stole it from Peter. Here in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, Peter says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear or reverence. What Peter is saying is he's encouraging these Christians who, by the way, were under some persecution. If you read the context, they were in some tough circumstances. He says, but here's what you do. First of all, you sanctify the Lord in your heart. What does sanctify mean? Well, the word could be translated hallow or to set apart as the, the primary focus of your heart. It's the same word that Jesus uses in the Lord's Prayer when he says, hallowed be thy name. It's the same word. So he says, here's what you do. First of all, most important, be sure that you have centered yourself on Christ. Because as we'll see tonight and through the rest of, of this series, the Holy Spirit is the primary answerer. He is the one who answers questions. He is the one that causes growth. You cannot save anyone. You never could. You never can. You cannot. Your job is to plant seed, to water seed. It's the Holy Spirit that gives growth. And so as we go through this, we're going to give you the same tools and, and ways in order to understand the basic questions that we get and to be able to apply these things in an understanding of Scripture and beyond Scripture. Because you know you're going to get questions from people who don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So how do you answer them? You can't say, but the Bible says they don't care what the Bible says. They want to know why you're a Christian, and if you say because the Bible says so, it's not going to mean anything to them. So what Peter is saying here is sanctify the Lord. And then always be ready. In the Greek, it's an, it's an aorist imperative, continuous tense. He's saying be prepared. It's like packing a lunch. You know, Anytime somebody asks you for food, you got a lunch and you can give it to them. Be prepared to do that. And this is where we get the word uh, apologetics. It's from apologia uh, in Greek. It doesn't mean to apologize and sniffle and whine. It means to make a defense, to be able to defend your faith. If someone says, why are you a Christian? The Lord expects you to defend your faith. He wants you to be able to say, this is why. And they say, but Christianity is old. It's outmoded. It's 2,000 years old. You believe in somebody that resurrected 2,000 years ago? And your answer is yes. And they say, why? Why do you believe that he resurrected? How do you know? You just read something? Isn't the Bible written by men anyway? Can you trust something that's just written by a bunch of old Jews? 
As a matter of fact, it's translated so many times. You get all these translations. You get all these different religions. You get all these different Christian churches, and nobody's right. So who's right? How do you answer that? I'm glad you asked. Okay. So we want to be able to give you the tools because once we get done, hopefully, Lord willing, you will have a, a, some tools and an understanding that will help answer your questions too. And you will be able to articulate an answer that makes sense both to you and to someone else. Because the Christian faith is logical. You don't have to check your brain at the door in order to be a Christian. It is logical, it is relevant, and it is true. And you can prove it. That's what we're going to do. So he says, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you and an answer, by the word, this is a great word here, to give them an answer, the word here is logos. It's translated in several different ways, but in this context, it means a logical answer. Isn't that interesting? Give them a logical answer. So if someone says, why are you a Christian? Because he makes me feel good. <laughs> and they say, he doesn't make me feel good, so he must not be for me. Your Christianity is not based on how you feel. And if you say, well, he makes me feel, maybe he does make you feel wonderful. That's part of being a Christian. But that's not an answer to someone. You need to give them a logical answer. I believe in Christ because I trust the Bible, and I trust the Bible because of how we got the Bible, and we trust the Bible because it has proven itself to be a message from outside of time and space. How did it do that? It did it through predictive prophecy. It is the only holy book in the whole world that predicts things in advance, and it has been right up to this point 100% of the time. And if it can predict something that's thousands of years in the future and predict a lot of them and it's continually right, you might begin to think that this is a message from outside our three-dimensional space. No other book can claim that. So I believe it. I trust it, and we'll get into all that. So as we go through this, we're going to talk about tonight just some of the questions, how the questions come, to give you some tools to understand how to deal with some questions in general. And then we're going to start talking next week about, does God exist? How do you answer the question? I don't believe in God. How do you know he even exists? Have you ever talked to God? Do you ever show up and say, hi, I'm God? He has an English accent, of course. Have you ever talked to him? Have you ever seen him? Have you ever... How do you know God exists? Can you give a good argument for the existence of God without opening your Bible and says, well, the Bible says he does? Yes, you can. In fact, you can give the very best argument. Very best. We'll get into that next week. And then we're going to talk about the Bible, why you can trust it. Where did it come from? What about all these translations? Is it really uh, written by men? How can we know that God actually spoke to us? Um, talk about Christianity as opposed to other religions. We say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by him. You know that's pretty exclusive. And for some people, that's pretty narrow-minded. We're going to talk about that. What is, makes Christianity different, and why does it stand apart from everything else? And then finally, we'll talk about those who are Christians, but in name only, and are basically cults, and they pervert the Christian gospel. We're going to talk about Mormon doctrine, not a lot. We're going to talk about the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine, not a lot. But we're going to do enough so that you understand when they knock at your door and they begin to talk to you, you'll have some tools to deal with them. You'll have some answers to their questions and their objections about your brand of, of Christianity. Okay, one more thing. Um, this September, uh, uh, listen to me, don't. Don't give me any accolades here. But this September marks um, the 41st year that I've been teaching Bible studies. I don't know. I'm telling you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and that's my thought. How can you teach Bible studies for 41 years and be 39 years old? <laughs> I don't know. My point here is in all of that time, there's been a handful of, of Bible studies that, that the Lord has really impressed on me to do at that time. Certainly he leads and has led 
to Bible studies, but there has been only a handful that, that I really got hammered and said, this is what you're going to do. This is one of those studies. This one's starting tonight. A couple months ago, the Lord woke me up and he said, prepare yourself. Get ready for this. And so I've been uh, preparing myself. When I first taught apologetics 41 years ago, it was one of the first things, when I first started teaching apologetics, I had been out of seminary for just really a few months, and I'd been doing this stuff for three years. And, uh, and when I got to that class, my intention was to give them everything that I knew in six weeks. And I unloaded on them, and by the time the second class was over, people were like... <laughs> It wasn't that I knew so much. It was just too much information, you know? You go into the, um, you know, the Septuagint, how the Septuagint version says this, but the, the Masoretic text says this, and then what if you get into the, uh, the, the uh, Alexandrian text and how that's different? They're going, please, give me a break. So I am not going to do that. Uh, yeah, I know. You're really excited about the Alexandrian text. Okay. Our goal is to give you tools to make it practical. That's why we call it practical apologetics. We want you to be able to leave here every week with a little bit more that you can use to share your faith. Because your job, as long as you can fog a mirror as a Christian, your job is to do two things. To love each other and to share the gospel. It's the only reason the church is here. We're here to go get other people to bring them in so we can love them too. It's our job. And so how we do that and how we do it well is important. All right, so you've got your notes. Let me talk about questions. Questions, questions. Anybody here ever get a question about your Christian faith? Anybody here ever ask you anything? Yeah. Anybody here not know how to answer them? Questions. You're going to get questions. You're going to get all kinds. I mean, they're unavoidable. You have questions. We all have questions. Some of these, you know, we've, we've put back in the recesses of our mind, and sometimes we, we bring them out and look at them, and, and there are things that bother us. There are things that, that cause us to wonder. And all of us have gotten to a place where we've questioned our faith. All of us, except Pastor June. Okay, so we've gotten to that place where we've said, you know, am I, am I following something that's true? Is this real? Or we've had someone talk to us, and we begin to question our faith. So we have questions. Questions really only come up in a couple of different ways. All of them can be lumped together, and it's important that you know particularly these two types of questions. Almost every question is an if-then question. An if-then question. If God loves me, then why? Fill in the blank. If God is good, then why does he allow X? X. One of the, uh, the great, uh, I put it in your notes, one of the uh, quotations you hear all the time from the uh, agnostics is, they say, if God is good, then he is not all-powerful. And if God is all-powerful, then he's not good. And what they're saying is that if God is good, then he would stop all of the evil that goes on in the world. But since he can't stop all the evil that's going on in the world, then he is not all-powerful. And that's a question. It's an if-then question buried in a, in a statement. What they're saying is if God's good, he'd stop everything. There's a reason he does not. We'll find out when we get to the nature of God. There is a doctrine that man has fallen in evil and depraved. The heart is desperately wicked, it says in Jeremiah. Who can know it? And there is a point to where we cause our own problems. And God is not willing or able to violate his own nature, to come and override your free will. God will never override your free will. So there's a lot of if-then questions. You'll hear those. There's also some presuppositional, okay, and I promise not to use these big words, but Linda said this is okay. Presuppositional, what, what it means is they, they have what we say in, in law when you go to, to, to a court of law, they say that there, there are facts that are not in evidence, in other words, they assume that this is true, and then they stick it on you and make you deal with it. And so it's a false premise. What they've said is X equals 2, and X really doesn't equal 2, but because of that, they go through this whole argument, and pretty soon you're left with trying to explain something which has no foundation in fact. 
This is very common. It's, it's also called a straw man argument, if you know what that is. A straw man is when you make up something which is not true, and then you go about, they go about to tear it down in front of you, just like this last statement. If God is good, then he wouldn't allow evil in the world. Look at all the evil in the world. People are killing each other. There's, there's all kinds of uh, terrible things happening to innocent people. They go on and on and on, and you're supposed to answer that. But the whole premise of the question is wrong. They have given you the straw man. They've torn it down in front of you and say, see, look, your argument is in pieces on the ground. It's a presupposition. Now, turn over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. We're going to see how the master deals with presuppositional questions. Matthew chapter 22. To set the stage here, this is the last week before the crucifixion, and Jesus is is uh, dealing with, the, with uh, the different rulers. He's dealt with the lawyers, he deals with the Sadducees here, and he deals with the Pharisees. Each one of them come at him with questions. They come at him with questions that they have been pondering as a group for generations because there's no answer to them. And so they've decided that they're going to stick Jesus with these non-answerable questions so that they can make a fool out of him. It didn't work. Okay, so down in chapter 22, beginning in verse 23. Let me just read through this and then come back. Verse 23 says, The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. That is in the law. If you marry uh, a wife uh, and you pass away, then your brother is supposed to take her as his wife if you have no children so that the children can be uh, raised up in your name and you have offspring. Verse 25, here's the hypothetical, which leads to the question. Now, there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married and having no offspring left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also. The third, even to the seventh. The last... Of all, the woman died also. After seven husbands, I don't doubt it. (laughs) Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her to be wife. This is a false premise. They have given Jesus a question based on a wrong premise or basis. You remember what it says in the beginning. They don't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in miracles, angels, or the resurrection. The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of of the Bible, which is the books of Moses. The rest of them they didn't believe in, just those first five books. And nowhere in there could they find anything that talked about resurrection. They didn't believe in it, and so now they're going to get Jesus. This woman, this hypothetical, a woman has is married, her husband dies, and then these seven brothers continue to marry her, no children, they all die, then the woman dies, they go to heaven, and their question for this preacher from Nazareth is, okay, so who's married to her now? Jesus disabuses them of their false premise. Look what he says. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken. Why? not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. By the way, this is the basis for almost every false doctrine and mistake that we make with scripture is because we don't know it and we don't understand the power of God. And they didn't. He said, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. So you've made a mistake. In other words, your premise is wrong. For in the resurrection, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So your premise is all wrong. Your, your, your argument goes away. And then he goes on to, to address, what about the resurrection? That was their real question. They wanted to nail him on that. So he knows that there is a question behind their question, verse 31. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? I love that. What was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. What he is doing is something very, very interesting. He is, he is not only 
quoting Scripture and taking it literally for what it says, but he's even making his case for the resurrection in the Old Testament based on the, the construction of the word. It's the tense of the verb. What he says is, God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That means present tense now. Because if they were not going to be raised or were not raised from the dead, he would have said, I was their God, but they're gone. But he didn't say that. He says, I am their God. Today, they are alive before God. Another um, presuppositional, I love this one. This is one you've probably heard. All roads lead to God. All religions have some of the truth, right? They say, look, God is like this, this, uh, he's like at the top of the mountain. And all of these different pathways lead to the top of the mountain. All of these different religions come up a different way, but they all end up at the same place, at the peak of the mountain with God. And so all roads lead to God. Isn't that beautiful? Are you going to fall for that? What's wrong with that analogy? God is not on a mountain. God didn't say that there's all kinds of ways to get here. What we do know, back to the Bible and its trustworthiness, Jesus says there's only one way. So if he's on a mountain, there's only one path. Everything else is the wrong way. Jesus says, I'm the door to the sheep. Everybody who comes in some other way is a thief and a robber. And so they have, they have missed the whole point of this by using this beautiful analogy that sounds great. There's another one that if you go to college or if you've been there, if you get into a religion class, this one we, will be given to you in order to befuddle you and to cause you to wonder about your religion. They'll give you this um, analogy about the five blind men. These five blind men are wandering around, and they happen to run into an elephant. Now, one is at the trunk, and he grabs the trunk. The other one is at the ear, and so he's grabbing the ear. Another one is by the side of the elephant. Another one is at the leg, and then finally the one in the back grabs a hold of the tail. And they begin to argue about what this elephant is. And what they will tell you in this college-level class with the professor is say, see, this is what religion is like. Different religions have see different aspects of God, and so they make their, their decision based on these different viewpoints. They, each one is correct, but they don't have the whole picture. It's another way of saying all roads lead to the same place, but they, they only have part of the answer, and so you can't fault one of the other. One is not better than the other. They're all correct, but they all are lacking a complete picture. Doesn't that sound great? What's the problem? The problem is God is not an elephant. And you're assuming that we're blind, and you're assuming that God will not tell you who he is. You've made that assumption that we have to figure it out on our own. That's a presupposition. You have supposed that God will tell you nothing. You've got to figure it out on your own, and that is not true. God has told us who he is. He's told us what he's like, both in the creation, which we'll talk about next week, but also as we get into the Bible, he begins to explain who who he is, what he is. He wants you to know, and he's no elephant. Not only did God want you to know what he's like and who he is, he sent his son. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Everything that the Father is, Jesus is. Everything that the Father would do, Jesus does. Everything you want to know about the nature of God is in the person of Christ. So how do we answer the questions? There's some basic ways to do that. First of all, when someone asks you a question, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? You can give them a direct answer. Yes, I do. The next thing is they may say something to you that you don't know how to answer. You know it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay. And here's what you do, and and Walter Martin was the best at this. Walter Martin, for those of you that missed him, was was the original Bible answer man on the radio. The guy was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But he started his ministry working in an office building in New York. And what he would do at lunchtime is he would literally go out on a street corner and stand there and (laughs) preach the gospel to people. 
But after a while, he started getting lots of questions. People asking things like this. Well, what about this? And what about that? And what about the, you know, the, the, what this says? Or what about what these people say? And he would answer questions. And the things that he didn't know, he'd say, meet me back here tomorrow. I will find out and I'll give you the answer. And he started doing that. And he started getting this wealth of information. And of course, after a while, he got his, his doctorate in theology and went on to be the Bible answer man. But he learned to, to answer questions where he couldn't answer them. He just said, I will find out. And that's a powerful way to get back to somebody who you're talking with, some family member or someone else. They'll, they'll ask you a question, and you really don't know the answer. You can say, I don't know, but I will find out. And it opens the door and allows you to, to continue the dialogue. Don't ever discount that. The other thing to answer is to understand, as we talked about before, but sometimes the questions you get are not the real questions. People will ask questions sometimes to, to either try and get you trapped or to try and get you flustered, but there are questions behind the question. And here's where you need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to sanctify the Lord in your heart. You need to be, be listening to the Holy Spirit. He will guide you. He will teach you. He will give you the words to say. Trust him when you get to that place, be cognizant of the fact that maybe there's something else going on. And you can answer that question, but you can go on then to answer the next. Jesus did this many times. Uh, one of my favorites, we won't go there for the whole thing, but I think you know the story. Um, Jesus in talking to the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well. Do you remember that? Okay, Jesus goes. He knows he's got to go there. He knows something's coming. He sits on the well, sends his disciples off, and sure enough, here comes the woman of Samaria. And Jesus starts the conversation. He says, give me something to drink. Now, this woman knows he's a Jew by the way he's dressed. They're in Samaria, which they didn't like each other. And this woman says, how is it that you, a Jew, asks me, a woman of Samaria, for something to drink? And Jesus says, if you would have asked me for water, I would have given you water that would last forever. He, he ignored her question. He went on to what the real point was and what she really needed. That is, she needed to have living water. And then she goes, well, you haven't got anything to draw with. So, you know, how are you going to get this living water? He says, this water will raise up in you like a fountain of living water, and it will permeate your being. That didn't answer a question. He's, he's ignoring the question, and he's getting to the point. Until finally, they get down to the end of this, and she realizes he's a prophet. And then she asks a real question, and he gives her a real answer. The real question is, our fathers say that we're supposed to worship on this mountain, but the Jews say we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus gives her a direct answer. He says, you don't know what you worship, but salvation is of the Jews. The proper place to worship is in Jerusalem. He gives her a direct answer when she finally gets down to the real point. It's a great study. I, I commend it to you, John chapter 4, in this looking behind the curtain and seeing something that uh, we don't always see. Finally, understand this. You're not going to have an answer to every question. This class will not give you an answer for every question. Nobody will give you an answer for every question. There are some things that you just can't answer. And it's okay to say so. Why did the Lord take whoever? Why did it happen now? I don't know the answer to that. I can't know the answer to that. There's nothing I can do to, to answer that question. So sometimes when you get that question, maybe your response is simply, I'm sorry, and you love them. God did not intend us to have an answer to every question. The entire book of Job is about not getting answers. The entire book of Job is to teach you that you don't get all the answers. As a matter of fact, when you finally... Listen to these guys, these, these three, four friends of, as it turns out, of Job, and Job himself going through all of the reasons why this thing happened to him, all the things we would do. 
I don't know why this happened to me. They tried to answer him. Well, it happened to you because you're a bad guy. It happened to you because you're too proud. It happened to you because, whatever. And they kept coming up with these answers. Then he would complain. Well, I wasn't that bad. How come God doesn't tell me what happened? And he goes on and on and on for 38 chapters. And finally, God shows up. And what does he do? Job, I will answer your question. I will give you all the answers if you can answer a few for me. If you can answer these questions, I'll answer your question. Where were you when I created the earth? Answer me if you have knowledge. And he goes through two chapters of where were you and did you know and do you understand? And, can you, and all of these things, by the way, are things in the physical universe. Not spiritual things, physical universe. Things that you can touch and feel and see. And Job had no answer for those any more than we do. And when he gets finally done with him, what God is trying to say is, Job, you don't need the answer to every question. And sometimes the answer to your question, even if you got it, is something that you would not understand. There's a time to trust and not get the answer to your question. And so for us, sometimes we have questions, and we want to know why. And God doesn't tell us why, and we get frustrated, and we, and we want to know why God doesn't tell us why. And then when the devil comes along, and he begins to say, it's because you're bad. It's because you've sinned. It's because you're ugly. It's because whatever it is. The reality is what God is telling you is, trust me. I got it. It's under control. You don't need the answer, at least not now, and you may never need the answer to that question. One of the most powerful things that you can do for someone, give them your testimony. The man who was born blind, Jesus came and he healed him. He could see. The Pharisees bring him in, all these doctors of the law, and lawyers and Pharisees and Sadducees and rulers of the people. They bring him in. They say, what happened to you? I got healed. And they start this debate about how he got healed and who healed him. And they found out it's Jesus of Nazareth. And they said, well, this man's a sinner. This man, we know this man is contrary to the law. He doesn't follow the, the traditions. We know that this is a, a bad man. What do you think about him? He says, I think he's a prophet. Oh, shut up. What do you know? <laughs> and then finally, they're not listening to him, but his most powerful response after all that, because nobody had an answer, right? Nobody knew how this could happen. They even said that no one had ever been healed of blindness who was born blind. There was no record in the annals of, of history. And so they're all asking, how did this guy do it? And this guy gives them the answer. Because there is no answer. He says, I don't know whether he's good or bad. But the one thing I know is what? Once I was blind, and now I see. And that is the most powerful thing. And so sometimes when you don't have an answer, sometimes your best answer is, look, I don't know. But this thing I do know. God's changed me. I was once this way, and now I'm this way. I have assurance, even though I've gone through the intellectual process, I have assurance in my innermost being that he is alive, that he's real, that he loves me, that I'm saved that he's paid for my sins, and that I am going to heaven. That can be the most powerful thing that you ever say to anyone. So don't ever discount your testimony. Because the beautiful thing about it is that it's real. No one can rob you of that testimony. No one can gainsay it. No one can criticize it because it's yours. It's very powerful. Just a couple of notes on using logic. Logic's okay. You know, God made us to be logical. Paul told Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind. God intends us to use our brain. He has given us curiosity. He wants us to, to think logically. Again, Peter's um, admonition to us is to give an answer. This is a logical answer. So he wants us to, to, to use our mind and our brain to think. And so there are ways that we can do that that are really useful. If I ask you, you guys, and I said, look, I've got a 401K, and I ask each one of you, um, is my 401K going to be worth twice as much money in 10 years? How many of you can answer that? No. No. 
No, no. How many of you have 401ks? You don't have to raise your hand. You've got 401ks. Let me ask you, do you know that it's going to make money 10 years from now? Do you still put money in it? You do, don't you? There's nothing wrong with that. Why do you do that? Why have you decided, even though you can't answer the question, that you will still put money in your 401k? Because you have made a logical decision. Here's what you've done, whether you know it or not. You have made a three-step decision. Number one, you, you have gathered information. What's the information? Well, these 401ks have been going on now for 75 years. And over the whole history of these 401ks, they usually make money. Yeah, there's ups and downs, but the net effect is that they make money. So you, you gather that information. Then you do, you, you apply understanding. Now you take all those facts, you put them together and say, okay, well, these kinds of things have done well and these things have done well and, and that's what my stuff is. My stuff is in these things. And so your conclusion is it's going to make money. Do you have all the answers? No. What you've done is you've gone through a logical process. You've gathered information. You have collated that information and understanding, and you've come up with a conclusion. That's what we do. That is how we approach people who don't believe in the Bible. We approach them with the same kind of logic, and we give them facts, and we, and we collate those facts together, and we give them a logical conclusion. I can show that God exists. Not beyond a reasonable doubt, any more than you can prove that your 401k will make money in 10 years. But I can give them a logical argument that God exists based on the preponderance of the evidence, which is based in fact, and you can rely on that. It's a logical argument. You do it by taking the facts, by taking those facts into, into an understanding, and then you come up with a conclusion. Conclusion is, God exists. A hundred years ago, Every scientist, every, every major university, everybody from Einstein and, and all of his colleagues, everybody in 1915 were absolutely sure without a shadow of a doubt that the universe was eternal and it was infinite. And that's what they taught. And that's what they did their equations on. And everything was built on that. And that was the paradigm up to that point. And if you would have gone to a university and said, wait a minute, I believe that the universe had a beginning and that it's finite. It, it's, it's, it has a certain size. They would have laughed you out of the place, tarred, feathered you, and sent you to San Jacinto. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's how we got here. Right? <laughs> okay. And that was the case until this guy, Einstein, came along and he came up with the special he came up with a special theory of relativity. The thing about this is this, this is the conclusion. I have a math guy here. So this is the conclusion of a lot of equations, and it spawned a lot of equations, a lot of things that then came from this that they had to surmise uh, mathematically were true. And as they begin to look at this, one of the things that uh, comes out of this, which the calculations show, is that the universe had to have a beginning. Time and space had to start somewhere, which means that it's not infinitely old. And it also can't be infinite in size because if it had a beginning, then it has a finite size as well. And uh, Einstein hated this thought so much that he, in his equations in the beginning, he put in a fudge factor to show that the, the universe was in a steady state model. And you'll love this, if you, you already know this, but he had part of his equation where you divided by zero and he got an answer that wasn't zero. You can't do that. And they finally figured that out, and when they did, they said, he, he recognized it, and later on in his life he said that was the biggest blunder of his career in trying to do that because he just didn't want to, to go away from that paradigm. And so by 1929, after uh, Hubble had shown that there's a redshift and the universe is actually expanding. Um, by 1929, the whole paradigm had shifted and they knew that there was a beginning. And at the time, these scientists were shocked. They were dismayed. And one of the famous um, scientists of the time, he said, you know, I fear 
that after hundreds of years of scientific endeavor and study, after a thousand years of, of looking into these things, science, men of science will climb finally that mountain of knowledge, and when they get to the peak, when they get to the summit, they will find that theologians have been there for thousands of years. Because the reality is what they were finding out is the model that they are seeing mathematically fits exactly what the book of Genesis says. Isn't that interesting? Here's what the, the equations show, one of the things. That not only is there a beginning that had to take place, but because time and space had to start somewhere, that means that it had to start with something which did not occupy time or space which means it had to be nothing. It couldn't start with anything because that would occupy time and space. And so wherever the universe started, which it obviously did, wherever it started, it had to start from a place where there was nothing. So literally, they, they found out that first there was nothing at all, and then it exploded. <laughs> and the question should come up, how? Yeah. <laughs> and when you read science books today, when you get, listen to lectures, when you hear all the things that the, the astrophysicists are doing, what you will hear them say is, you know, 10 billionths of a second after the Big Bang, this is the conditions. They never say this is the condition before the Big Bang because there is no condition. It is nothing. Do you know what Genesis 1-1 says? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. you know what it says in Hebrew? Bereshit bara Elohim. Bereshit bara. Bereshit means to create. Bara means from nothing. Literally, what the Hebrew says is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth from nothing. That ought to give you some pause. So, here's a hint. You want to talk to someone, they say, well, how do we know there's a God? Because there has to be a cause. Everything we know has to have a cause. The universe obviously had a cause. It started from nothing. How can it start from nothing? It had to have started from something that was outside of time and space. It couldn't be part of time and space. It had to be outside of time and space. And it had to be intelligent. We'll get into that next week. The, the complexity and the delicate nature of the universe... The fine-tuning of the universe is so precise that they've estimated, that particularly in like gravity and some other things, and the gravitational waves that create matter, it says if those things were off by one part in a hundred thousand, life could not exist. It's very finely tuned. And so you say, you don't believe that God created this? Well, no. How do you, what do you think happened? I think nothing exploded <laughs> on its own. One book that, I'm, that I've read a few times and I, I will recommend to you is I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. <laughs> and this is what he's saying. Is you really going to believe that? All the evidence points to a creator and design. You're just going to say, no, I don't believe the evidence. I want to believe that first there was nothing, it exploded, and then we all came to be. <laughs> Not possible. Okay, so we'll talk about that. There are tools. And I just digressed. You guys didn't stop me, and I'll hold her responsible for that. Okay. <laughs> all right, so all of this comes down to, and you'll hear this, and I'm not going to hammer this too much. I just want you to be aware of it because it may come up. This all kind of boils down to something called a syllogism. Syllogism is just a, a tool that you use for logical argument. And a syllogism used correctly is very useful. But what you want to look for is people who use logical arguments incorrectly. Remember, I talked about a false premise, and you know, pretty soon you have to try and prove something that's not provable because the premise is wrong. Here's a syllogism. It has three parts. It has the, the two premises, the, the major and the minor premises, then it has a conclusion. Here's a syllogism. All cows drink milk. All right? Now, we know that because we go out and we check all these cows. That's gathering facts, and we realize, look, that cow's drinking milk, and so is that one. And then we get all of our friends to go check the, uh, the dairies and the farms, and they, and they all come back and they say, every cow we've ever seen drinks milk. So after a while, you get all these facts, and so you put it together, 
and you use your mind and you get your understanding, and you say, look, all of these facts say that cows drink milk. Therefore, we can conclude that all cows drink milk. That is a fair assumption. So your first premise is all cows drink milk. Great, got it. Then we do the next one. Hey, look, I got this cow. Her name is Bessie. I just bought her. I have not seen her drink milk, but because we know that all cows drink milk and Bessie is a cow, I can conclude logically that Bessie will drink milk. And see, that is a valid syllogism for lots of reasons we won't get into. That's valid. But see, you can take what sounds logical. Beware of this. Someone can take something that sounds logical and use that same approach, and it can be completely wrong because they have done it wrong and they've given you a false premise. Let me give you an example. Same thing. All cows drink milk. John drinks milk. John's a cow. (laughs) Doesn't that sound logical? It's fair. They've done all the logic. They've come through. What's the problem? The problem is they forgot and they assumed that John's a cow. All cows drink milk. John drinks milk. That doesn't mean that John is a cow because he drinks milk because they just said all cows do. And so it's a logical uh, fallacy. It's, it's wrong. And this will happen to you. People will take you down the primrose path and they will try and tell you something. Just be aware of the fact that listen to what they're saying and realize, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. It's like the all roads lead to the summit of the mountain, right? God's not a mountain and not all roads lead there. Okay, just remember that. Okay, every answer to every question resides in the truth. The truth answers every question. Remember this. Jesus said, I am the truth. When it gets down to it, the answer to every question resides in him, and we'll get to that later on. Okay, just a couple more minutes. Let's talk about the truth. Anybody ever tell you, well, that's your truth? (coughs) What's true for you is not true for me, right? Which you can say to them, That's, that's it's what my dad used to say. That's, that's balderdash. Because here's the thing. The truth, the nature of the truth is this. The truth is always true for everybody and forever. If everything else ceases to exist, the truth will still exist. Because the truth is what is. You can't have your truth and me have my truth. There is only one truth. It is the truth. It is what actually is. And just because you don't like my truth doesn't mean that my truth is not the truth. Got it? You'll also hear this. There is no such thing as absolute truth. What's wrong with that statement? It's absolutely false because they just made an absolute statement. They said there is no such thing as absolute truth, and they made an absolute truth about truth, (laughs) which means it's a self-defeating statement. I'm going to talk more about this as we go along, and trust me, I'm laying the groundwork. As we see this, as we start going through this, I'll point out some of these arguments, and you can see, well, this is a self-defeating statement. They've said something which defeats their own purpose. So by saying there's no absolute truth, they've just defeated their whole statement. The truth exists. It is true for everyone. It does not change. It's interesting. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth doesn't change, and neither does he. Isaiah says, or Malachi says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change because he is the truth. When you get to Exodus 3.14, you remember when, when uh, Charlton Heston went to the burning bush? <laughs> and it was his own voice coming back from the burning bush. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Except he was talking much lower. <laughs> Listen, if you want to know what God sounds like, it's where he talks like this. If you hear that, you know it's the Lord. He goes to the burning bush, and he says... <laughs> I am your father. <laughs> Luke, I am your father. Okay. Sounds, yeah, it sounds like that. Okay. 
So he goes to the bush, and the Lord is speaking to him from the burning bush. And uh, at one point, Moses says, well, who am I going to say sends me to the children of Israel? Because they don't know his name. After that point, he's been called Elohim, El Shaddai. But the personal name, who is it that's sending me? And he says, I am that I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. The essence of what he's saying is, yeah, that it's been taken and put into a, a name. It's been put into what we call Yahweh or Jehovah or the Tetragrammaton, the, the, the YHWH, the Yahweh Vavhe. It's been put into that. But what he was saying to Moses by saying, I am, he's saying, I am the absolute ground and basis for being. I am the, the basis for existence. I am everything and to everything. I am the ground of truth. Everything is in me. I am that I am. It is the, the best way, the only way that we could possibly get a handle on what God is trying to say who he is. I am that I am. He's always been. He'll always be. He's always been God. And he says, I'm the ground of being. And he's given him that, that insight. He is the truth. And Jesus, who came along being God, is the truth. The truth is eternal. As I said, if everything else ceases to exist, the truth will remain because the truth is everything ceases to exist. The truth remains, and he is eternal as well. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And finally, hmm, the truth is exclusive. What does that mean? It means that the truth is, and everything that's not the truth, is false. So when someone says to you, you believe that Jesus is the only way, yes. Isn't that narrow-minded? Yes. But don't you believe that there are all kinds of ways? No. Well, why not? Because there's only one truth. And if he is the truth, then everything else is false. Well, what makes you think that he's right? We'll get into that later. What about the resurrection? Can you show that Jesus resurrected from the dead? Yes, with the preponderance of the evidence. Can you do it without a shadow of a doubt? No, no more than your 401k. But you can show by the preponderance of the evidence that in fact, yes, it is logical to, to believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead. And you can make the case. And we will. All right, last couple of minutes. Let me do this real quick. There are things that keep us from knowing and, and understanding the truth. And I want you to, to understand this as well. When you talk to people and they ask questions or you're witnessing to someone and they have objections or they... They, they want to, uh, to either attack your faith or they want to ask questions about your faith. Understand this, that there are people who cannot believe because they need to know more. And that's okay. That's what we're here. We're, we're here to, to help give answers. That's that, what Peter is saying. Be ready to give an answer, a logical explanation to why you believe. But there are also people who will not believe. And that's a big difference. Someone who cannot believe can be helped by giving him the evidence. Someone who will not believe is a whole different animal. And there are those who will not believe. They have made that determination. What do you do with them? You pray for them. You hold them up because the only one that can break through that is the Holy Spirit. It is not your job to beat them into submission and make them want to believe because you can't. They will only come to a place where they can believe if they abandon the I won't believe. So understand that. Also understand this. In the years that I've been a Christian, I've talked to a lot of people, talked to a lot of cults and, uh, and people who uh, disagreed and people who had questions. And I don't remember any of them falling on their knees and saying, you're right. Now, did people come to the Lord? Yes. Did people change? Absolutely. Our job is to plant the seed, to use another analogy. Our job is to plant the seed. 
you plant in their heart some answer to the question which creates a doubt in their own unbelief. Someone comes along later and waters that with more information. And the Holy Spirit brings these different workers to that person in different stages of their development. And that's what happened to you, by the way, if you think about it. Each one of us were wooed by the Holy Spirit. And each one of us, people were brought to us that gave us information. And and that information was something useful. And some of us took longer than others. But your job is to plant seed or to water. That's all. You're not, you can't expect that somebody is just going to come slobbering to you after you've got done answering all their questions. What happens is after a period of time, we'll see the hands go up in church, you know. Trust me, there's been a lot going on in that person's life. God has been dealing with that person, and somebody's been planting seed, and somebody's been watering that seed. And the more stubborn, the more water, the more seed that gets planted. That's your job. Don't get discouraged. So let me sum up with this tonight. Thank you guys for coming. It is important for us to be able to share our faith. We're going to run into all kinds of questions from all kinds of people with all kinds of motives, and we can't answer every question. But we can equip ourselves to be ready to answer most questions. So we give them answers. We are doing what we're told to do. We're preparing ourselves giving answers to questions and loving the Holy Spirit do His job. Thank you.